This is excerpts from a novel, Sleepwalking in Paradise. First chapter, the narrator is a homeless man in a state of perpetual ecstasy. You open, chapter 36, you open your eyes. Broad avenues and mansions and the green shagginess of pine and eucalyptus. The breeze is salty and cool. You can feel the ocean. The scent lifts off the trees and perfumes the air. You breathe deeply and feel the energy dancing all around you. This is a planet. This is the moment. This is home. The sky feels closer here. Not big sky country like Montana or Wyoming where you grew up, but an immediate sky. Like a low ceiling you can reach up and tap with your fingers. Hey, you angels, quiet down up there. Although you are, wo although you are wonderfully, delightfully lost, you know you are close. The tug has brought you all the way here to his doorstep. So close, you're spinning like a compass at the North Pole. You're not worried. You're not worried. You'll find him the same way a ball finds the bottom of a hill or a river finds the ocean. The tug is the ultimate form of gravity. And when you do, you'll bring Tommy to him too. That's the task he set for you what he told you to do the night he gave you back your eyesight. Someone you know is in danger. You have to save him. Who? Who? Who's in danger? Listen, you are close. Someone you are close to. Someone who's helped you. Listen. You don't know the answer until the precise moment you say his name. Tommy? And then you had the vision of Tommy, slipping further and further away like a child, wandering into the forest, blind to all the dangers and the shadows. Find him, John. Bring him to me, and we'll save him together. You brought Tommy to the park, and nothing happened. But that was okay, because he warned you. It's not going to be easy, John, so keep on trying. Three is the charm to everything. Turn, turn, turn. There is a season. Turn, turn, turn. The street dead ends into a low wall. The tall green forest of the Presidio teems on the other side. The pine and eucalyptus trees sway and dance in the wind. The high branches swirling in a choreography of circles within circles, ripples within ripples. Before you lost your eyesight, trees didn't dance like this. But they must have, they must have. You just didn't see. You spend long moments watching, and the beauty makes you weep again. A thousand years later, you turn. A thousand years later, you turn around and walk back to the main avenue. You're walking in a straight line, but inside you are swirling and spinning with the trees. So close you can feel it. You walk in circles, waiting for the tug. Maybe around this corner. Chapter 37, not, not the homeless guy. The streets of Presidio Heights were empty. Uh, is this okay? Is this like feet being bad? Oh, louder, okay, I can go louder. The streets of Presidio Heights were empty. I'll just be a moment, Marta told the taxi driver and ran up to the Claiborne mansion. She'd only been here twice before, both times for Claiborne Senior. The three-story Tudor bloomed beyond the outer wall, larger than Marta remembered. She took a deep breath and pressed the intercom button at the gate. No one answered, so she pressed again, listening for the corresponding buzz within the walls. The intercom crackled. May I help you? A female voice. Yes, it's Miss Sandoval, Mr. Claiborne's assistant. After, click, after buzzing at a click, Marta pushed through into the courtyard and climbed the steps. A massive oak door with ornate grillwork opened, and a stout African woman, African American woman, appeared. She looked reserved and elegant in a gray suit. Reading glasses dangled around her neck from a thin gold chain. Miss Sandoval, of course, she smiled. I'm Arlene Flanagan, Mr. Claiborne's house manager. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, to have a face to put together with a name. They shook hands. The pleasure's all mine. Marta pulled a pharmacy bag from her purse and handed it to Mrs. Flanagan. It's speed. <laughs> Thank you. Won't you, come in? Won't you come in for a moment? I've just made a pot of coffee, she chuckled. 
Lord knows he's been drinking it as quickly as I can make it. I'm sorry, but I really must run. My sister is in the hospital. I understand, Miss Sandoval. Marta hesitated. How is he? Is he all right? Miss Flanagan sighed. He's very tired, but I expect he'll feel better soon. She held up the bag and smiled. Her face tilted and she looked into Mar Marta's eyes. How are you holding up, dear? Marta suddenly felt all the weight she'd been carrying for the last few days. She wanted to collapse into Mrs. Flanagan's arms and cry and tell her everything about her sisters, her mother, her ex-husband, Laszlo, all the things pressing her into the ground. But she couldn't. She had to be strong. I'm fine, she said instead. She thought about the taxi waiting for her. I must be going. Please give Mr. Claiborne my best regards and tell him not to worry about the office. Take care of Miss Sandoval. Marta ran down the steps and rushed out the gate. She collided with a large homeless man on the sidewalk. Her momentum pressed her up against him like a wave crashing against the seawall. He had a silver beard and piercing eyes and smelled like leather or earth and coffee all at the same time. He stepped back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, are you all right? Marta ignored him and straightened her dress coat. The homeless man stared at the Claiborne mansion. Excuse me, but do you know who lives in this house? Marta said nothing. She clutched her purse and jumped into the cab. The man loomed in the window. He wrapped the glass with his knuckles, his hand as worn and battered as an old work glove. Ma'am, please, I'm just looking for someone, a friend. Driver, please. The taxi glided forward, and Marta exhaled as if she'd been holding her breath for hours. She told herself that she'd done everything possible for Mr. Claiborne. In a few minutes, she'd be back at the hospital, holding her sister's hand and praying for Laszlo. She did not look back at the homeless man. Thank God.